Hello, everyone. Okay. So before we get started, can I ask you if there's an empty seat at your table to wave so some of the folks who are still looking for seats can get one? We are truly the friendliest division. Um. <laughs> So on behalf of the Tim Division, I'm delighted to welcome you to our Distinguished Scholar Luncheon. This year's Distinguished Scholar is Alfonso Gambardella. <laughs> so as many of you know, Dr. Gambardella is a professor in the Department of Management and Technology at Bocconi University. He's also a member of the ESMT Berlin Academic Board, a fellow of the Strategic Management Society, and a research fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. He is a prolific, impactful, and very caring scholar. Throughout his academic career, he's made significant contributions in research, teaching, mentoring, and service. As you all know, his research examines the implications of firm innovation activities for strategy, market structure, and economic growth, connecting the areas of innovation management, strategic management, and entrepreneurship. He is currently the editor um, of the Strategy Area and Management Science and has served as the co-editor of the Strategic Management Journal, roles through which he has developed and shaped many research papers and ideas. And I know he's very much helped us on some of our own publications. So he received an undergraduate degree in business and economics from the University of Genoa, a Master of Arts in Economics from New York University, and a PhD in Economics from Stanford University. Um, I've also learned that he is a, ve a very accomplished flute player, so I do hope that someone somewhere will comment on this um, in the next hour. So today we're going to hear from Alfonso and celebrate his many accomplishments. But first, we're going to hear from some of those in the profession who know him the best, his doctoral students. So presenting on behalf of his doctoral students are Elena Novelli and Rafaela Conte. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so, uh, Sonali asked me and Raffaele to talk briefly uh, about Alfonso uh, as uh, we are his former students. And so, in order to do so, um, Raffaele and I decided to challenge ourselves. And after years of conducting natural experiments and field experiments, uh, we decided to do something that we have never tried before, which is a qualitative analysis. <laughs> So please bear with us because that's the first time we tried this type of endeavor. So in terms of methodology, what we did to celebrate Alfonso was to ask his students and co-authors to send us a note in which they would indicate how they met Alfonso, share some an anecdotes about Alfonso as a supervisor, co-author and colleague, and then add a message to Alfonso. I want to say that this has been a collaborative research project. So I want to start by thanking all of you in this room who have contributed to, uh, to this. And uh, the result is already in press. It is here, actually, <laughs> incredibly fast. Uh, and so uh, I'll ask my beautiful assistant uh, uh, to hand it over to Alfonso um, so that he can read all of your comments, all of your notes. But uh, at the moment, what we want to do <laughs> is to uh, share some of the key themes that have emerged out of this exercise. So first of all, Alfonso emerged as uh, an intellectual leader. So the booklet is full of notes, quotes, that uh, remark how he shaped the field and generations of scholars uh, in the field. So here you have some of them. He led the way in helping us understand technological innovation, a fabulous editor who is able to get directly to the central uh, logic and problem in a paper. His contribution to the field have been extraordinary. Um, challenging conventional wisdom, visionary in research, and inspiration to generations of junior and senior scholars to rigorous and relevant research. And this is just, of course, a little sample of the many wonderful things that have emerged. As a second key theme, Alfonso has also strongly emerged in all these notes as a joyful, energetic, and enthusiastic person about research. Uh, his contagious enthusiasm impressed me since the very first days of my university experience. Uh, either Alfonso has figured out how to clone himself uh, 
or he knows how to set the clock from summer to winter time and back 12 times a day, every day, so that his days have 48 hours. Um, Alphonse and I both got our PhD in 1991. Since then, I've become 32 years older, but Alphonse stays exactly the same. <laughs> And also, uh, another thing that has emerged in these quotes is how his general joy about life merges with his joy about research and they blend together. So here is an example. Um, uh, one of you said, you get a lot of suggestions from him and have fun at the same time. Driving near Urbino and talking about uh, something else, most likely soccer, suddenly Alfonso would ask, but tell me, what do you really think about the independence of irrelevant alternatives? Um, Alfonso has also emerged as a non-academic career destroyer. In the sense that the uh, booklet is full of quotes of people who had a very successful career in consulting, in the industry, <laughs> in the public sector, and then they met Alfonso and like Saul on his way to Damascus, saw the light and left everything that they had to follow him. Here are a few examples. I first met Alfonso during my PhD studies and it was actually because of him that I decided to pursue one in the first place. Another one, witnessing firsthand the success of the PhD program he established in Pisa and reading his research inspired me to leave my permanent job at the Italian ministry, despite my mother's desperation, <laughs> and start an academic career. Alfonso also emerges in this booklet uh, very much uh, as an Italian. Uh, <laughs> Here are some examples. Someone said, Alfonso's melodious Italian accent transported me to sunny, <laughs> to sunny landscapes of vineyards and olive trees. Through our joint efforts in developing, revising, and resubmitting our paper, I came to appreciate the immense value of academic collaborations. And another one, I was driven by Alfonso once around Milan, I vividly remember using both hands, often pressing them against the dashboard <laughs> to fight the forces of inertia and deceleration. I was very thankful for the seat belts. <laughs> of course, this may be just a manifestation of cross-cultural differences. Alfonso might be highly skilled in the art of Italian driving. Alfonso is also, for those of you who know him, uh, this will not come as a surprise, a good eater. <laughs> here, here are some examples. At the end of each day, after long discussions about the specific details of the research and the grand plan, Alfonso always has a grand plan, we had many unresolved questions to address. Every morning, Alfonso would show up with renewed optimism and at least five potential solutions meticulously handwritten on a scratch pad. After some coffee and pastries, the discussion became so exciting and insightful that Alfonso proposed to stay longer and order a burrito. <laughs> and here is another one. I could remember his childish joy when he was asking Raffaele Conti to get two additional desserts, <laughs> due cassatine, and put them in the middle of the table besides the desserts that the three of us were already having at the end of an already quite heavy Sicilian dinner. <laughs> uh, Alfonso is also an institutional builder. Uh, someone said he completely, and these are just examples of the many quotes we received uh, in this direction, he completely revolutionized Bocconi PhD and contributed to building Bocconi's brand as an international research institution. In just a few years, it changed the program and its external perception completely. There's also another one, another quote that will be dear to, our, to the heart of many in this room, which is uh, about when more than a decade ago, probably 15 years ago, Alfonso started together with, with Will Mitchell, uh, what was called the Bocconi Duke PhD hybrid seminar. It was visionary in many ways. The ones having more fun were probably Alfonso and Will, who could go over and over talking about different perspectives on the papers and opportunities for research. I would like to stress, uh, this person continues, how much I actually learned during the seminar besides having fun long-term perspective, passion for research, innovation in teaching, ambition and tolerance for failure, continuous learning as an attitude, building networks, generosity. Some of the many things Alfonso teach me, teach us.
And last but not least, Alfonso emerged as a generous mentor. Uh, some of the quotes in uh, this uh, area, for example, were uh, this one that says, he raises the bar constantly and continuously. He pushes you to keep challenging yourself, and he challenges you in turn, driven by his relentless search for knowledge and for the next big theoretical challenge. He dreams big and sets great plans for his students and then turns them into milestones that are more practical and achievable. And another one, in life, you will find only a very few people who will be ready to give you advice that will improve you, but that it is hard to hear. Because people typically care more about being liked than they care about you. These very few people include moms and Alfonso. <laughs> so, Having heard all of this, you might ask, where is the catch? <laughs> so, well, the truth is that there isn't a catch. If you've not been this lucky in your previous research collaborations, we are just sorry for you. <laughs> As someone in this booklet put it, uh, one could not ask for better. So on this note, I want to thank you, Alfonso, on behalf of all of us, and I want to wish you all the best for the next 30 years in your career. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much, and of course I am uh, I am moved and impressed, and uh, and uh, and really really very very thankful. Uh, I look forward to reading the booklet at this point, even though I think Elena gave uh, the the essential abstract and uh, and uh, and notes. So thank you very much, and uh, so I was asked to give uh, my reflections. Okay, and uh, and uh, so this is what I want to do. But uh, uh, I think for the first time in my life, I would like to start uh, with the, the typically the last slide that we use uh, in, uh, in, um, in our presentation. And this is basically thank you. So, so thank to the team leadership for, for making these decisions. Of course, uh, I am, uh, uh, someone asked me, are you, what is your, yesterday, what is your sentiment? Are you excited? Are you, are you preoccupied? Are you uh, nervous? I think the, the sentiment I have, I am honored. I'm, I'm really, really honored. Cary Grant, just to make a, <laughs> a singular <laughs> comparison, when he won uh, the Oscar for his uh, uh, lifetime career, he said, there is nothing more uh, important than being recognized by your colleagues. And so I really think uh, that that applies here. And my thanks, uh, as I said, goes to the team leadership uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity, but it really goes to everyone, to, to, to my students, uh, as, as Elena was, uh, said, to my collaborators, co-authors, uh, uh, and to the community at large, because uh, I think I learned a lot from many, many people, both in writing and, uh, and uh, in, um, in, uh, in conversations. So, and many people are in this room, so, so clearly uh, this is a collective um, endeavor. So let me say, so what do I want to say? So I, I thought carefully about this, uh, this, um, uh, this talk. Uh, as some of my good friends, uh, Nell, for example, knows, I never prepare slides uh, 15 minutes uh, before uh, the talk. I have to say that these times I prepare them 15 days. Because, so I was actually good enough to the joke, uh, the joke uh, at Bocconi is that when I press the button of the elevator to go uh, down from my house uh, to class, it's then when I prepare the class. So <laughs> while I wait, the elevator coming up. So this was really taken very seriously because uh, I think it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, honorable uh, uh, situation. So what do I want to do? This, I took this opportunity to really reflect on, on what I did uh, and clearly what I did within a community, together with a community, and so it is my own uh, perspective, but it's really very much shared by the many people that have actually helped me share this. And what I would like you to remember out of this talk is two words, innovation and relevance. And let me tell you why I think these two words are the words that I would like you to take uh, away from this, uh, from this uh, speech. Because they, they are really <coughs> the key words 
that uh, we need uh, in our profession, in our social sciences, in order to understand uh, what we want to do and what we can do. Innovation in particular for the team division, but also more generally, and relevance because we are a discipline that needs to do relevant things. One administrator at Bocconi, uh, high-level administrator, uh, gave a talk recently, and I really think she nailed down what we do. She said, uh, what social scientists do, they are like the architects of cities. So they are the people who think how cities should lay out. They are the people who think how cities should be organized. I think that, and she said, the social scientists are like this. They think of how the world should be organized, how it should be laid out. What are the important issues for communities and social milieus to actually uh, nurture, develop, and grow? And I think that this definition applies very well. We are architects, like the architects of cities, we are the architects of societies in thinking about uh, how we can, uh, how can organize uh, communities, people, and, and activities. So we have to be innovative because we have to push the frontier, but we have to be relevant because we have to talk about uh, buildings that stand up, we have to talk about organizations of cities where people like to live, and so we have to talk to the relevant issues. So let me start with this then. So how do we achieve this innovation and relevance uh, uh, challenge? So think about it in this way. This uh, line, it's really the frontier of knowledge. And so you can be below the frontier of knowledge, or you can aspire to go beyond the frontier of knowledge. If you are working within the frontier of knowledge, you have data. So you know how things work. Basically, yeah, it's not exactly uh, the, the selling of a product in France, uh, but you have to sell it in Italy, but it's pretty much the same. You can, you can use data for France to predict quite well what is happening in Italy. There is some level, level of innovation, of course, because you will be innovating, but the data help you a lot. The problem is when you are outside the frontier. Because if you want to push things, if you want to learn about things that you do not know, then you do not have data. And so what do you have to do? Well, I think that we can come up with two things. You have to have imagination. You have to imagine the future because you don't have data. But most importantly, you don't want to be a visionary. You need to have theories. What are theories? Theories are ways to make your imagination plausible. Why? Because if you create causal links, you say, if this is true, then this must be true. You may still be wrong, but it's more persuasive. People will be persuaded to a greater extent. I will uh, elaborate on this uh, more, but this is very important. Of course you need data, but it's a completely different kind of data. It's not data that, you are, that are available. It's data that you have to build because you have to run experiments that test theories for which you do not have data. So still data, but the data have to be produced in order to test theories, not to create correlations about things that you know. So this is basically what has driven me. Really the search, uh, and I did not coordinate with Elena, of course, but, but uh, I think uh, this is really what I have been uh, thinking about and this strive for pushing this imagination and thinking about what would happen next. So what are the sources? And again, I'm reflecting on what I did. And I also want to clarify one thing before I move on. I am proposing the way I did things. But I don't think that this is meant to say this is the way you should do things. I am a strong believer in uh, multiple paths to, give, uh, to, to reach a certain goal. I am just providing you with my experience. Feel free to say, oh, there are a few things that I can take advantage of, or oh, now I understand why I should do it differently. So I would like you to keep this with this spirit, okay? The spirit is to provide you with my experience so that you are more knowledgeable, you have an additional observation in your data set, and you can use that data set the way you want. What do I think are the sources of this imagination and theories? I was recently uh, at the NBR, Sandy Mulai Nathan for the, from the University of Chicago used this word. You have to look for anomalies. Uh, this is not a new concept, but the, the word I think uh, captures very well what, what I think. 
I have looked systematically for anomalies, things that did not fit what I expected. And you have to build on old knowledge and create new knowledge. The anomalies trigger your imagination, raise the questions, because there are things you do not know. The old and new knowledge help you to create the answer. Because building on all the new knowledge, you can create the answer. And I'm sure that you are very familiar, many examples of why all the new knowledge matter. But I think one good example is this paper by Brian Uzi and others um, on, in science. Uh, they, they, <coughs> sorry, they analyzed 17 million scientific papers and actually show that the most impactful papers have combinations of typical and atypical citation pairs. They have roughly two thirds of pairs of citations that have already been used in other papers and one third that were used for the first time. This is a good example of why you need to combine old and new knowledge. And then here is my view of where do the anomalies come from. I think that reality has more imagination than imagination. By looking in our profession at what happens in the real world, you can find out things that you never thought. If you start sitting, and let me imagine my next paper, I think you are, you are really fishing in a very shallow pond. But if you learn about what is happening around you, you really find some very important anomalies. So let me exemplify this to you in two ways. This is my ex post rationalization of what I do, what I did. There is no, when I was uh, in the famous 1991, uh, of course I did not plan all this. I mean, this is my ex post rationalization of what happened. But basically I did two projects. One is markets for technology, of which I will talk in a second. And the other one is what I am embarked, have embarked now, which is called theory driven decisions, if you want and uh, which I will talk about in two seconds. So let me start with markets for technology. Anomaly. My anomaly has a first and last name. And this is Ralph Landau. Who is Ralph Landau? Many of you probably know him. The chemical engineering building at MIT is named after Ralph Landau. The Department of Economics at Stanford is named after Ralph Landau. Who is Ralph Landau? So let me tell you, uh, the way he was introduced to me when I was a graduate student by Nate Rosenberg, my advisor. He said, this is Ralph Landau, a chemical engineer. He has two patents, which are uh, patents about the key steps for the purification of the reptilic acid. I said, good for him. <laughs> Nate uh, immediately realized that I was not understanding. And so he said, uh, the purification of the reptilic acid is a key step in the production of polyester fibers, which is the most widely synthetic fiber sold in the world. Then I immediately stood up and understood who I was talking about. Why is Ralph an anomaly? Because in a world in which R&D was integrated in companies that were also doing the manufacturing and the final commercialization, so essentially, and by the way, even at Stanford Department of Economics, David Mowery had a thesis showing that in the, between the two wars, there was increasing integration of R&D into, into uh, manufacturing and commercialization. By the way, David was actually figuring out another anomaly because everyone thought in the 1920s that R&D was actually something that could be bought and sold, but this is a different story. Now the world had moved into the David Mowery perspective, and Ralph, interestingly, he sold his patents. Rather than saying, oh, now I purified the reptilic acid, let me sell the polyester fiber, which is something that might sound very weird to you now, but it would have been the natural way of thinking about this. Ralph said, no, no, let me license it. Let me give it out. It was a clear anomaly. It was an anomaly for several reasons. And as a matter of fact, when Ashish and I started this research, I vividly remember a very prominent scholar. The two of us were graduate students who basically said, no, this is not working. 
I'm telling you because I consult with many companies and this is not happening. And I think she was right. But the point is that we were imagining the future. We were not looking at the past. We took Ralph Landau as the anomaly for what could have happened in the future. So what did we do? We said, what is the old and new knowledge on which we built? Well, our advisor was obsessed with Adam Smith. He used the word division of labor practically every day. And, uh, and uh, he was pushing us on this idea. So what is division of labor? Well, we know. Basically, if you have an input, and this input has a high fixed cost, and essentially uh, the high fixed cost gets spread over a larger output, the average cost actually declines. So if you are a company and you have a certain size, you have a certain average cost. But if there is a specialized producer that actually produces the input for a bunch of other companies uh, uh, in the market, actually the average cost drops dramatically. And uh, what Adam Smith said is the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. This is a very important source of efficiency, vertical specialization. So what we were asking is, so Ralph is crazy because, uh, because uh, uh, or he's completely right because he's taking advantage of this. But then we said, why not in technology? Why technology is not taking advantage of these great opportunities? And so what did we do? Well, we were in the world in which there was a lot of knowledge. And so Ken Arrow, am I pronouncing it correctly? <laughs> I, I made it, I made the point. This is a joke between Sarah and myself, we'll figure out later. <laughs> so Ken Arrow and David Tees had actually insisted on this point. They said, look, if you do not have appropriability, if you cannot appropriate the good, then you cannot sell it, you have to integrate. Nate Rosenberg, our advisor, made a more subtle point. He said, Capital goods and technology in particular have, a, have, a, have an odd property. In order to use them, they have to be very specialized because the user need a very specialized tools that cannot be used by others. So Nate said, you cannot make the size of the market by reselling the capital good or the technology as it is. You can only make the market if the technology is general purpose. It can, the same specialty can actually be used in different applications. So the market is not made by depth, it's made by breadth. And so he said, this is a limitation because technology tends to be very specialized and fairly narrow. So what Ashish and I did, we said, but there is a change. Software, remember, we are at the end of the 1980s, beginning of 1990s, software, uh, engineering sciences, um, Biotechnology is actually creating a scientification of knowledge. What is a scientification of knowledge? Is making knowledge an object, a compound. And this is why the chemical industry licensed a lot. It made knowledge a software program. So knowledge became an object. And by becoming an object, the object of the transaction could be defined and a patent could create the probability. On top of that, Science, by definition, strives for breadth. You want to think of general purpose technology, general purpose knowledge. And so what we did was to say, this element of new knowledge built on the old knowledge would actually create uh, a market for technology. 10 years later, John Cantwell, Suma Trey and John Cantwell published this paper on research policy which basically shows the, the uh, pink uh, line is patents, the blue line is uh, royalties from licenses. When uh, Ashish and I started thinking about this, with Nate and Ralph, of course, that were, we were there. So where were we? We were at the moment in which we started observing the anomaly. Why then things actually mounted up later? Because we had a theory, we had a logic. We saw the anomalies, we created the logic, and this actually made the prediction. Of course, we have many research programs that failed because we did not make uh, such a good prediction, but so there's clearly a selection bias in what I am prompting to you here, but it gives you a sense. So the anomalies triggered our effort 
to understand what was going on, anomalies coming from the real world. And this actually turned out to be an interesting uh, prediction for the future. Let me give you my second uh, expert experience. Theory-driven decisions, same pattern. What is the anomaly? Well, this time uh, with Arnaldo Camuffo, we met uh, this uh, entrepreneur. Someone was actually created a, a high-level, high-growth company out of nothing in the software for financial trade businesses. He was a student in one of our executive class. We were teaching the scientific approach, showing our experiments. He said, this is super interesting, but you got it all wrong. So let me explain to you what the issue is. And so the thing that struck us was uh, that he told us immediately, my purpose is to learn. We said, learn? You are an entrepreneur. Your purpose should be to maximize profits, to actually create satisfying profits, to create growth, employment. What do you mean by learning? So we started to dig into what did he really mean into this. There was all the new knowledge. There was uh, Jackson Nickerson and Todd Zenger had written this beautiful piece in Org Science in 2004 where basically they say framing the problem is the key to understand how things actually work. Teppo Fellin and Todd Zenger had a similar emphasis in 2017. And Arnaldo and I, along with uh, Chiara and Alessandro Cordova, we actually ran a randomized control trials in which we had seen that empirically it is true. People who actually think in terms of theories seem to have uh, effects. So what did we learn in this theory-driven uh, decision story? And this is really triggered by, by Andrea and the way he thinks and he wanted us to understand and rationalize what he was doing. We, it's funny because Andrea calls us your industry. He, when, when we talk to him, he says, because your industry, which is the academic uh, research uh, uh, activity, so he says, your industry focuses on actions. What do you mean focuses on actions? Your industry thinks of it in this way. There is an action that produces value, and this also has a cost. And in a very deterministic way, you want to understand the action. So basically, all your business is to understand how we choose actions. Then uh, we said, uh, is right. And actually, this also happens when things are not deterministic. Because suppose that now the value that you create with the action has a probability p of occurring, and uh, a probability 1 minus p that this is actually 0, OK? Then uh, our industry solves the problem in a simple way. Our industry says, yes, but it's the same thing. You focus on action. There is a probability P that you actually get the value from that action. There is a cost, and it's the same problem. This is actually a problem of risk. OK, you are taking a risk. This is an expected value. But our industry is actually even uh, more sophisticated and says, no, 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 no. We know that in our industry, decisions are not made on objective probabilities. This is not like tossing the coin. This is not like saying, if I toss a coin, probability is one half. In our industry, we know that we, you cannot define an objective probability. And then his response is, uh, well, fair enough, but you still think in terms of expected probabilities. This phenomenon is called ambiguity by the decision scientists. We do not know what P is, but we form an expectation of what P is. What Andrea tells us, this is still the same problem. You focus on the action. And even though you are thinking about this expected value of P, how is this expected value of P formed? OK? It's just your best guess. So he says you should focus on theories, which is a different story. It's the upper level. It's the higher level. And he says, what is a theory? Let me give you this example. I'm sure that you're all aware that uh, Google tried to do the digital glasses, and it was a failure. Now, you have to know that uh, Luxottica, is one of the famous uh, Italian multinationals for stylish fashion glasses that actually Arnaldo knows very well, has recently written an agreement with Meta based on the following theories. The reason why Google failed is because the digital glass has to be fashionable. 
And so the theory is, if I design the Google Glass, no longer the Google Glass, the digital glass in a fashionable way, the market of digital glasses will exist. This is the bet, it's a theory. Now, what is the difference? The difference is that yes, there are actions of course downstream, but the key is something else. The key is uh, this uh, expected value of P given X. And what is the difference? The expected value of P on the actions is a guess. This is a theory. Why? Because there are antecedents. Because they are trying to explain uh, what would be the feasibility of this market based on antecedents that they observe. What do they do? Well, essentially this is what they do conceptually. It's the same thing that we do in our regressions. They have a theory, beta is greater than zero, and they have a belief, I can produce a fashion glass. So, is it true or not? We do not know. We will see in the future. Uh, but this is the theory on which looks off case betting. Why is this problem important? It is important because uh, what you do, what you really do, if you want to move to the upper level, the one of the imagination theory and so on and so forth, your big job is not to choose the action, but it's to find what X increases expected P. So you need to find what are your theories that actually produce a higher level wedge between the outcome of your actions. Just to give you an idea, they could have developed a completely different theory. If Eric von Ippel was here, he would have said this theory is bullshit. <laughs> we need to do, seek the lead users. Take the lead users, chase the lead users, and uh, they will actually do the digital glass. It's a different theory. Who knows, is Eric right? Potentially, but I'm sure that this is what Eric would say, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, they bet on a different theory. That's it. But this is key because understanding whether Luxottic or Eric is right, it's the key to create value. Because now, now the effort has moved to the focus on the action, to the focus on what the world will look like, which is really innovation. Because it is moving in the frontier, not inside the frontier. If you were inside the frontier, action is the only thing. But if you are beyond the frontier, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to competing theories to be, to be addressed with one another. Then we understood why Andrea Pignataro said, my purpose is to learn. Because he says, your industry has many, many, many problems. But one good thing about your industry is that you think. And you are an industry capable of producing theory. And this is super helpful. Because I can talk to you, he literally says that, I can talk to you and Arnaldo, and he says, in spite of the fact that you are 60 or over, <laughs> you can produce lots of theories. And, uh, and this is good for him. We also like to test the theories sometimes, uh, not just to, to conjecture on the theories, but, but, but he is right. Because he, he, he really wants to know how to produce the digital glasses and he wants us to give logical links and causal links that make this expected value of P, the success of the market for digital glasses, more or less uh, uh, plausible. And so we really understood that anomaly, why my purpose is to learn. The other thing that we understood is that theory-driven decisions has many applications. Technological innovations is the most obvious one. You have to have a theory, not a theory about uh, the technology which is not our business, and I'm sure that there are plenty of people who can do this very well. It's a theory about what to do with it. Uh, I, we had recently a long conversation with uh, AJ Agarwal at CDL in Toronto, and he was telling us, these people come here, these entrepreneurs, they know everything about the technology, there's no uncertainty, but they do not know what questions to ask in order to create a business. So these are people who actually need theories Theories from scratch, from imagination, because we don't have data. They need to ask the questions. And this is exactly why innovation requires this ability to create theories. 
But of course, we can think of, Schumpeter told us, we can think of innovation as very broadly. Mergers and acquisitions, choice of CEO, innovation in the capital structure of the firm, ESG, how do we actually do ESG policies better in an innovative way? We need to have theories. This is a very, very general, uh, general thing. Okay, so takeaways. And then I'm going to be a little bit provocative. So first takeaway, I work on research programs. So I was uh, taught and I was actually pushed to work on research programs uh, by my formation in the in graduate school. And, uh, and I've continued to do that. Maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a, as Elena nicely pointed out, maybe this is just a preference or something. So I reflected on this. So what is the outcome of research programs? And again, I am not going to convince you that you should do research programs. That's not my purpose here. My purpose is more positive analysis. What does a research program do for you? The first paper of a research program has an incredibly high average cost. Paper number six has an incredibly low average cost. What I call the mushroom strategy. If you know what mushrooms are, you know that mushrooms actually grow randomly. Okay, the wind actually spreads the seeds and they can come wherever. If you adopt the mushroom strategy, which is a very respectable strategy, which essentially is a, let me maximize the number of papers that I can produce, it's exactly the opposite. The first paper has a fairly low marginal cost, uh, average cost, but the sixth paper, let me tell you, has an incredibly high average cost because how many good ideas you want to have. And, uh, and this is the difference. And so this is why we see sometimes in the tenure process, situations in which people, once they get tenure, this has been actually documented by the uh, Journal of Economic Perspective, tenured professors are exhausted. But right, because they have to go through this incredible ordeal. The advantage of the research program in this respect, and again, I'm not pushing for the idea, is that you keep going. At this point, you pay the fixed cost, you keep going. Think about people like Ashish or Arnaldo. They are obsessed with doing research, even today because they have a research program. They have, in the back, they actually have this engine which brings them everywhere. You have to be open. Uh, the greatest, uh, I think, input I got, as I said it at the beginning, was openness. I was open to tell people what I thought. My, I never, never, never thought if I tell this idea to Anita, she's going to steal my idea. No, I just, oh, Anita, I have a great idea, okay? And Anita, is, I picked Anita for a good reason because Anita would immediately say, yes, I also have this other great idea. And a, so I think openness in the end, yeah, it could be. It could be. There could be free riding, okay? But in my experience, the net effect has been hugely positive in uh, working with a community of people who is willing to do this. The final thing I have to do is uh, something that is a little bit more recent. We put a lot of effort in what we were doing. <laughs> I think, uh, again, Elena created this very nice. Remember, we are in the system two thinking business, not in the system one thinking business. I am afraid that, uh, and this may be because I'm now over 60, and so the classic, when it's always better when you were young. Uh, so <laughs> I agree with you. There could be that problem, okay? So, so discount uh, that problem. But I have the sense that uh, we sometimes have forgotten that we are in the system two thinking business. And I was actually found an interesting article on PNAS in 2016, beautiful article which is actually entitled Science in the Age of Selfies. Basically what this article says is that, and it actually says, I'm citing, okay? Relata refero, the Latin you to say. I'm referring of things that were referred to me, okay? This article at some point says, we are spending too much time in communicating our research as opposed to doing our research. And it also says, and again, relata refero, it also says this is particularly true of the younger generations. Now, I think we have to take this seriously. Ashish, Arnaldo, Nate, 
Kenaro, these were people who put tremendous effort in their research, really system to thinking, and they were actually people who communicated probably too little. They should have communicated more. But effort was the main thing. And there is this book that I'm sure you know, the 10,000 hours. If you do something for 10,000 hours, the 10,000 hours rule, something gets accomplished. And, and let me also say this. I have spent my life uh, with a community of people whose level of intelligence is by far superior to the level of intelligence of the population. In this selected part of the world, genius, I didn't find many. Five, six, maybe. I found people who made the difference because of their effort, mostly. So this is actually important, and it's important that we overcome the age of selfies. Actually, if we write a paper, we have to think carefully about the paper. And we have to think carefully about the research, we have to go back and forth, and actually we have to try to establish one thing in a fairly effective way. So, I am at the end of my talk, and at a terrible juncture. Because uh, I actually had this terrible idea of asking around, so what do you think I should talk about? No one cared about what I was talking about, but everyone cared, will you talk about your family or not? <laughs> With incredibly, incredibly divided opinions. <laughs> Some people said, this would be the most terrible thing you want to do, please no. Please, please no. Other people said, oh, what else do you want to talk about? Talk about your family, if people want to know who you are, where do you come from? So. Caught in the middle, I said, let me make a compromise. Let me call uh, my family my domain. So let me give you, where do I come from? Why the preferences that Elena was actually uh, highlighting, where do these preferences come from, okay? Uh, and actually this is true. I mean, maybe they are genetic, maybe they are uh, uh, nurture, okay? I, I don't know, um, but uh, let me tell you where I come from. And then, then I think that, again, my ex post rationalization, there is an answer to the question if I dig into what my family looks like. So first and foremost, my family had a preference for learning and education. There is no doubt. I have gone back, strong preference for learning and education. Interestingly, at the beginning, studies as a necessity. My grandfather, the father of my mother, he was uh, the classical son in the south of Italy, the first son out of, I don't know whether 13 or 15 uh, uh, um, siblings. Uh, uh, because he was the first one, he actually had to work for everyone else, okay? And, uh, and, uh, but still, he was actually studying while he was working, and he actually made up into the lab. But even before him, my great-great-grandfather, so the grandfather of my grandfather, he was uh, south of it. This is the south of Italy, okay? Amalfi Coast, for those of you who know where the place is. He is allegedly, he has a patent. Actually, he figured out. 1847, he has a patent for a particular combination of a safe. Now, in my family, you have to know, and this is again to give you the full domain, the typical joke with my friend is that there is something called the exponentialization of the Gambardella family, <laughs> which basically works in this way. What I got originally was that the guy had invented the safe. No. <laughs> he did not invent the safe. He invented a particular combination of the safe. And I was the only one in the family who actually took uh, the time to go check the patent and figure out that the legend was a legend, okay? He did not invent the safe. I also have an uncle once who told me, actually just to give you the sense of this, he actually told me, oh, you are doing a PhD at Semper, very interesting. I should introduce you to this friend of mine. You know, he's the guy who invented the computer. I said, oh, okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the typical exponentialization. But fortunately, we keep, it, we keep it in the family, okay? So we don't give it out. I'm giving it out for the first time. This is instead my grandfather and my grandmother. And, uh, and, uh, and this is telling you a little bit more closer of where I come from. My grandmother was an amazing woman. Um, so my grandfather, as I said, he only worked 24 hours a day all his life to, to basically support uh, many families. My grandmother was an amazing woman. Uh, she was an orphan. Uh, she was born in 1903. 
And uh, when uh, she actually left the orphanage at the age of 17, so in 1920, she was taken out of the orphanage and gave as a bride uh, to someone whom she did not know, okay? So she was married, out of the orphanage, married. She had uh, three kids with this person. Then at the age of 27, she realized, like uh, many other people, that she wanted to get married. So what happened is that she met someone, my grandfather. Now, my gra grandmother had a particular feature that I think, uh, unfortunately, I inherited, which is she does not have filters between what she thinks and what she says, okay? <laughs> so what she did, now, we are in uh, Amalfi Coast in Italy, small village, in uh, 1927. Uh, by the way, my grandmother was also anti-fascist. And because she had no filter between what she thought and what she said, she was known to be quite active in the area. There was no divorce, of course. So she found a solution. She went to the husband and she said, look, we have a problem here. Ah, what is the problem? I want to get married. There was no divorce. So the solution she found was to get uh, my grandfather into the house and for 25 years, uh, she lived with my grandfather and the husband <laughs> in a different room. With my grandfather, she had two more girls, the last one being my, my, my mother, and uh, this is the way they lived. And uh, this is in the Amalfi Coast in the, in the 1930s during the fascism, with someone who's actually very active in, uh, in declaring what she thinks. Interestingly, she had a talent. She was a, I, know, I did not meet her. She died in 1955 by, by cancer. I was born in 1961, so I never met her. She, be, she was a painter, and actually a quite famous one, and I figured out recently with my sister that she has a Wikipedia page, a long <laughs> Wikipedia page, and even more interestingly, in the Wikipedia, Wikipedia page, we figured out that my mother had another brother whom we have never known, <laughs> known about, he died when he was young, but no one has actually ever told him. When I asked my mother, I said, uh, but there's Luciano as well. Ah, you never asked. How can I? <laughs> <laughs> so this was my grandmother. The other grandmother I had uh, from my father's side, I think from her I inherited the entrepreneurial spirit. Because uh, uh, just to give you an idea, she was not educated, but strong, strong uh, uh, sense of uh, that education matters. And, uh, and uh, she created a bunch of activities for disabled child, children because my aunt actually had a serious illness. She was disabled, so she really created uh, a serious activity. But the thing that was striking about my grandmother, she's, she was like Ralph Landau. Uh, um, at 85, like Ralph, she was planning for the next 30 years. I would talk to my grandmother, because in the next 30 years, this is what we have to do. Okay, so as you can see, Elena, there are <laughs> elements of commonality here. <laughs> and then we go, of course, to the modern days. This is my father and my mother. Of course, I mean, at this point, with this, uh, with this uh, imprinting, uh, it was very obvious that we had to study. And what I tried to do is basically to bring this to my children, who are actually even more obsessed uh, about education than uh, normally what we do is actually we take and talk to them about this, and, uh, and they, they know that they have to get an education. For them, it's actually the obvious uh, thing to do. So, last but not least, I'm now going to do something that will probably kill myself. <laughs> because, of course, Miriam, my wife, whom I will not show a picture because uh, most of you know her, uh, she was a very, very strong, uh, very strong position about, please don't talk about the family, let alone talk about me. <laughs> so, for those of you who know Miriam, Miriam could be defined as the anti-Kardashian. <laughs> so, Miriam's point is uh, anything that brings visibility, especially if not deserved, is an incredible problem, okay? And so, you should not do anything. And uh, so, I think this uh, collects, recollects the, the story of the science in an age of selfies, because uh, because Miriam's point is exactly that uh, we should actually do things rather than communicate about things. There are many things I learned from Miriam. 
and I will not actually tell you then because otherwise it will be a long story. But there is one thing that Miriam keeps telling me and my daughters uh, and all my other kids. Uh, and this is basically the following. You should be careful because if you are good and you self-promote yourself, you look arrogant. But you know, if you are not good and self-promote, <laughs> you look ridiculous. So with this, uh, thanks Miriam for helping me not to look ridiculous. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So Alfonso, thank you so much thank for you. that talk. That was amazing. And thank you so much for all your contributions to this community. In fact, this is a community you have had a strong hand in, in creating. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. On behalf of the division. Thank and you. Thank, thank you, you. Sonali. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we know we're coming up on time, so normally we take a few questions, but I think we're gonna, you know, let you head out, but I think a number of us will be here. There's also the Tim Business Meeting um, this evening and the Tim Social after that. Tomorrow we have a full slate of events that we'd love to see many of you at. So I hope you continue to join us for the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.